Good afternoon, everyone. Today, the Adams Seminar has the great pleasure of welcoming Professor Gennady Gore. Professor Gore obtained his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in theoretical physics at the St. Petersburg University. And after his PhD, his research experience includes postdoctoral positions at Rutgers University and Princeton University, and also as a research associate at the Naval Research Lab. Nowadays, he's an assistant professor at the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. His research is focused on porous materials, developing and applying theoretical and computational methods to solve a wide spectrum of engineering problems related to porous materials and solid fluid interfaces. Professor Gore's research has been pub published in more than 60 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and some of his research areas include adsorption-induced deformation, elastic properties of confined fluids, morphological changes of atmospheric black carbon and molecular modeling of organophosphorus compounds. So once again, thank, welcome Professor Gore. Thank you so much for being here with us and feel free to start your presentation. All right. Thank you, Arthur, for, uh, for the introduction. And uh, let me start sharing the slides and uh, I hope you, uh, okay. uh, I hope you see the slides now, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about compressibility of nano confined fluids, and uh, I'll try to relate the atomistic modeling to uh, some experimental measurements uh, from the ultrasound propagation. And I want to start with something which I don't want to leave for the end. Uh, I want to give credits to people who contributed to the work I will be showing today. It's mostly work of Chris Dobrzhansky, my former PhD student. He's currently a postdoc at Rowan University. Max Maximov, another PhD student of mine, who's now a software senior software engineer at Uber. And Nick Carenti, who is currently a PhD student at Rutgers University. And finally, Professor Boris Gurevich, uh, a geophysics professor from Curtin University, Australia. And uh, the motivation, the overall motivation for this work is, uh, well, people got interested in fluids in nanoporous media recently because of, well, the, the shale gas and the shale oil uh, revolution. So exploration of development of these unconventional resources is, um, a big thing. And uh, one of the key difference with conventional hydrocarbons is that these systems, uh, the system is nanoporous. The systems where these hydrocarbons are um, stored are nanoporous and the hydrocarbons are often in the absorbed state in the, um, in the pores. And I picked a couple of, couple of SEM images of uh, shield sample, these pores are fairly large, but still um, still quite small con compared to conventional reservoirs. So um, on the other hand, we coming from um, statistical physics, from thermodynamics point of view, uh, we know that spatial confinements have a lot of effects on fluids. Well, in the first example, which comes to mind, which is very common phenomenon is a capillary condensation. So we know that uh, vapor would condense uh, at the pressure, which is different from well, normal vapor pressure if it's in, in confined, if it's in a tiny pore. And that's the principle of working of nitrogen porosimetry, right? Because these, this, these curves are nitrogen absorption isotherms on uh, porous materials of different sizes, where you could see these uh, phase transitions related to capillary condensation. Very well known, widely used phenomenon. Um, another example is uh, shifting of the freezing point, another phase transition. Well, if you have, um, let's say water in a nanoporous material, it can stay liquid at the temperatures way below, uh, way below the uh, normal freezing point and these peaks on the endotherms or, uh, correspond to the freezing transitions. And uh, while well, phase transitions are not the only um, phenomena which are related to, which, uh, which result from 
the confinement effects. For example, if you look at the derivative thermodynamic properties such as thermal expansion coefficient, uh, they actually would differ uh, for the fluid in the pore compared to the bulk. So this is this is the bulk thermal expansion coefficients, and this this these are the thermal expansion coefficients of water in pores of different sizes. Uh, so the main question is: Does confinement affect compressibility of fluid, and how one can measure it experimentally or predict theoretically? Uh, and that's something I'm going to be talking about in this presentation. So in order. Uh, in order to give an idea of experimental methods here, I want to remind uh, some basics of wave propagation in elastic medium. Uh, so there are two types of elastic waves, the P waves or the longitudinal waves when the displacement is in the same direction as uh, the wave propagation or S waves or transverse waves where the displacement is normal to the direction of the wave propagation. And the longitudinal waves can be uh, related to the longitudinal modulus of the material. Uh, we call it M here in these slides. Um, and uh, it's easily related to the velocity uh, and the density of the medium. So same thing, uh, transverse waves, um, they are related to shear modulus. Again, it's a very simple formula. So these two moduli can be directly calculated if you know the density of your sample and you know the velocity of uh, the wave propagation in this sample. Well, finally, there is a hydrostatic, if well, you have a hydrostatic compression that can be related to the bulk modulus of a material, be it solid or fluid. And the bulk modulus is related to the longitudinal modulus and the shear modulus with this simple mechanical expression. So we are interested in porous media. Furthermore, we're interested in the porous media which are saturated with fluids. And here is a, this is not a real sample. This is just a schematic to explain what is, uh, what, is what on, um, in, the further, in the further discussion. So when we want to describe the elastic properties of a fluid, of, of a porous sample saturated with fluid, we would need to consider first, well, the properties of the porous sample itself. So the K naught is my bulk modulus of the uh, dry or drained um, uh, porous solid. Then a different thing would be Ks, K solid, the bulk modulus of these solid grains or if you're talking in terms of porous materials rather than granular materials, you can say it's, it's the, the modulus of your pore walls. So it's a bulk solid. Um, then you fill the pores with the fluid and you have the modulus of the fluid. You have your elastic properties of the fluid. And while obviously in experiments, it, you can't measure it directly. So what you're actually measuring in an experiment it would be the modulus of these composite of this solid fluid composite and then if you're well interested in the fluid specifically and that's um that's what i'm interested in particular um you need to relate it the modulus of the composite to the modulus to the moduli of the constituents with certain equations and uh in pore mechanics uh there is a famous Gassman equation, I'm going to show it on the next slide, which relates the modulus of the fluid saturation, fluid saturated porous medium to the modulus of the grains, the modulus of the dry solid and the modulus of the fluid. So that, that I, I, want to, I want to emphasize that uh, theory, the Gassman theory applies only when it's fluid which is in the pore so the shear modulus has to be zero and the shear modulus of the um of the porous material filled should be equal to the shear modulus of the dry porous material uh and the gassman equation it looks it's a simple algebraic equation which has well all these moduli fluid solid and the modulus of the porous solid and also the the porosity the fraction 
of the voids in the material. And while experimentally, you don't really, if you look at wave propagation, you don't really measure the, uh, the bulk modulus. Instead, you measure the longitudinal modulus and the Gaussman equation can be easily rewritten for the longitudinal modulus. So this is what experimentalists can measure. And this is what we're specifically interested in, these modulus of the fluid. And uh, we want to know if, if the confinement would affect it, right? So, and that's, um, that's one, one thing which is important is that has been derived from macroporous media. Uh, and only, only recently we showed that actually works for the nanopores media, but that's, that could be a whole separate story. Um, so when I talk about the porous media and I will be showing some experimental data, it will be literature experimental data, uh, not, not mine yet. Um, but although, of course, the problem is motivated for by hydrocarbons, well, they're, they're too complicated. The shales are too complicated to deal with. So the data will be shown will be all on Viker glass. It's a, a very frequently used model porous medium for, um, for adsorption studies, for overall, for studies of fluids in nanopores because it's, uh, it's a monolithic sample. It has relatively narrow pore size distribution. Yes, the pores are disordered. The, pore, the pores all have these uh, channel-like shapes, but, um, but the width of the pore is roughly, uh, well, roughly the same of six, seven nanometers. Um, and while well, I will be showing the experimental data, which was obtained in the following fashion, and I'm I'm gonna this is a this is a cartoon of the setup used by uh, this author more than uh, three decades ago, uh, but it's a uh, well it's something it's something we're still it's it's something we're still interested in pursuing and. Uh, or, um, repeating some of these measurements, but anyways, uh, so the idea is the following: you take a you take a solid sample, solid porous, uh, solid uh, sample. You enclose the container. You have it exposed to a vapor. You control pressure and temperature. The vapor can be absorbed. You can measure the change of mass of your sample, um, and therefore you can measure the density of your sample. Right. At the same time, if your sample is monolithic, you can attach two ultrasonic transducers to it, generate a ultrasonic pulse and measure the time it takes for the pulse to go through the sample. And in this case, you can measure the velocity of the wave propagation of the sample. You can measure it in situ during the absorption experiment. So you have uh, from this uh, time, you get the velocity, you know, rho v squared, so depending on whether you're generating uh, longitudinal or shear uh, or transverse waves, you can get the longitudinal modulus and the shear modulus. And this is actually what has been done, as I said, more than 30 years ago by the work, um, by, in the work by Warner and Beamish. And I'm gonna show their results and some of the calculations we've done based on their results. So they used nitrogen absorption on Viker they showed this nice absorption isotherm, volumetric measurements of uh, nitrogen absorption uh, on a Viker sample, very standard, typical isotherm for um, nitrogen absorption on mesoporous material. Um, at the same time, they used, um, they measured the velocity, and here is the plot of the velocity, relative velocity, V over velocity of the dry uh, sample is a function of the relative vapor pressure. And you could see that uh, while the transverse wave, and I made it the same color as the isotherm, the transverse wave is actually has the same shape as the isotherm, just flipped upside down. And that was the point in their, of their paper. They actually proposed to use transverse waves to measure the amount absorbed because, well, the, it's a, uh, they, they proposed it as a conventional volumetric or gravimetric methods. The only problem, I think it was too challenging to do it. Uh, and we're limited with these um, monolithic samples so that the method works. I'm more interested in longitudinal uh, velocity and this, uh, which behaves differently. And actually, 
after this, what, uh, what we did, we, we took the data from Warner and Beamish and we calculated the moduli based on their data. So first of all, this is the shear modulus of the sample, the relative change of the shear modulus of the sample as a function of vapor pressure. So you see there is a less than 1% change and it's um, really, really not changing much. So you could, you could more uh, rather call it a noise than, than a change. Well, which is expected, right? So you absorb in fluid, fluid doesn't have a shear modulus and therefore the, shear, the modulus of the composite is not changing. Well, the picture with the longitudinal modulus is completely different because uh, these are, and these are two, the, the longitudinal modulus was calculated by two different ways. I'm not gonna go in detail, but uh, they're very much comparable. So till the point of capillary condensation, till this phase transition on the isotherm, uh, the module is pretty much not changing the longitudinal modulus. Uh, then it changes abruptly and you can actually see that even after that, it's continued to change, continue to gradually increase. So um, after their uh, initial work, there was another group, um, a famous group by David Weitz, uh, who back then was at Axon, now at Harvard, uh, they measured, uh, they performed similar experiments with a different fluid. They looked at hexane at room temperature uh, and uh, they measured the adsorption isotherm, they showed the adsorption and desorption isotherm. And at the same time, they measured these um, velocities of wave propagation, again, on, in adsorption and desorption. Here you can clearly see, especially on the desorption uh, branch, you can clearly see this trend, these gradual change of the, of the longitudinal modulus of the sample. And uh, you could see that it changes at capillary condensation, but then it continued changes after that. Uh, and that's, a, that's something which, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, so recently, uh, the, these type of experiments were visited by German group by um, Klaus Schuppert and Rolf Pelster, and uh, they performed measurements again on a Vicar sample. They performed the measurements of argon adsorption, and uh, again, what they observed the modulus is um, the modulus is not changing until the capillary condensation. The capillary condensation changes abruptly and then continue increases. And you see this trend here when you go and desorb um, and you would see the decrease here. So the, the two straight lines which are drawn here are um, the lines which I obtain if I take Gassman equation, if I plug in the properties of the solid sample uh, and there's a, well, there is a certain arbitrariness in how you define the elastic modulus, the Ks uh, for Vicar glass. It's quite hard to measure what would be the elastic properties of the pore wall. And then I take the, the fluid modulus as if it were bulk liquid argon, right? At these conditions at 87.3 Kelvin. And you could see that the difference, well, irrespective of how I, how I, what, what I take for the, um, uh, which way I choose for the calculation of the modulus of the solid, the, uh, the Gassman equation would under predict the overall modulus. So, the fluid, if I take the, the fluid properties as the bulk fluid, they're, they're lower than, they're noticeably lower than what is observed in experiments. And actually it's the case for other uh, experiments as well. So another piece of experimental information before I get into modeling is, uh, again, this is from the same work uh, by Shepard and Pelster. They, uh, they measured their relative change of the modulus, uh, sorry, relative modulus and, and this, uh, of the sample. And at the same time, they measured the elongation of the sample. So what is called adsorption-induced deformation. If 
I ever get a chance, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. That's a fairly, well, now it's fairly well-known phenomenon. Uh, we wrote a few years back, uh, we wrote a, a large review paper on that. Uh, basically, every material, when you absorb fluid on it, it, it deforms. The strains are typically low because the materials are solids and you would need uh, very high stresses uh, to deform them, but still they're easily measurable. So what, what they showed here, they showed that um, the change of the modulus uh, of the fluid, or sorry, of the sample is correlated with the adsorption induced deformation. So that was yet another connection, which I enjoyed and I decided to look into it uh, from a theoretical standpoint. So I'll summarize the experimental finding. The modulus of the fluid saturated porous sample depends on the vapor pressure. It's correlated with absorption induced deformation. And even at the vapor liquid equilibrium at the saturation pressure, the modulus of the fluid clearly deviates from the bulk value. It actually is larger than the bulk value. And then the questions to the theory, can we explain these effects theoretically? And can we calculate the elastic modulus of confined fluids? And the, of course, the answers are yes, otherwise I wouldn't be presenting it here. Um, so I'll switch to showing some modeling results. And uh, as I mentioned, there, uh, there were two PhD students and one undergraduate student involved where there were many more results than compared to what I show. I'll limit myself with argon results, but we looked at other fluids as well. Um, so, but qualitatively, I have to admit, we did not see anything which would qualitatively differ from what we saw for argon. So instead of the modulus, which is convenient for mechanics, right? Um, the, we, in thermodynamics, we typically deal with compressibility. So I is a thermal compressibility. It's a thermodynamic property, which is de de determined by this um, uh, partial derivative. In statistical mechanics, uh, the isothermal compressibility can be calculated from fluctuations of various properties in various ensembles, depending on which ensemble you take. The most straightforward and the most natural, if we're looking at absorption, we're typically using crank canonical ensemble, and therefore in grand canonic ensemble, if we look at the fluctuation of number of particles in the system, it will give us the uh, isothermal compressibility. Strictly speaking, this formula works for bulk, but there are many, many works where people applied it for, um, uh, for calculating of compressibility of fluids in confinement. And one of the criteria, which for example, even London and Lipsch should say, while well, they didn't uh, in, in the textbook, they obviously do not describe, discuss any uh, compressibility and confinement, but the criteria they, they apply is, well, as long as the distribution is Gaussian, as long as the distribution of the fluctuation is normal, well, you can apply this formula. So we look at Leonard Jones argon in spherical silica pores, and I, did, I don't show the solid for the pores here because we use the integrated potential. Uh, we assume that both fluid fluid interacts using Leonard Jones and the solid fluid interacts using Leonard Jones, but instead of modeling all the atoms explicitly, we use the integrated Leonard Jones potential over a spherical surface. And we do conventional Monte Carlo simulation in the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, the only thing which we do different is that we run the simulations uh, longer than it's typically done for, to get absorption isotherms. Um, and that's in order to get good uh, distribution of the fluctuation to make sure that, that we have this normal distribution for the fluctuations from which we can calculate the uh, compressibility. So if I show you the isotherms, this is the isotherms in terms of reduced density versus pressure, relative pressure, which is calculated uh, from Johnson's uh, equation of state. Uh, it's um, uh, you know, nothing, nothing surprising for Leonard Jones fluid in, uh, in a simple pore. Um, uh, the different pore sizes, two nanometer, three nanometer, four nanometer, and five nanometers. And, uh, what we're interested in, we're interested in this part of the isotherms when the 
after the capillary condensation, when the pore is already filled with the fluid, uh, and for each of the points here, and you can see the error bars in these points, basically from the error bars, from the uh, fluctuation of density, we can calculate the compressibility. And so that's uh, pretty laborious in terms of, well, we had to run each point quite long in order to get these nice uh, normal distribution for each of the points, but then we take calculate the, the sigma of these distribution and get the isothermal compressibility or well one over compressibility, which is the isothermal modules. And um, this, these are these are not the best curves, but these are the curves which we published in uh, first paper by by Chris de um, So I took them as is. These are the moduli of the fluid in the pores as a function of the relative pressure at different pore sizes: three nanometer, four nanometer, five nanometer, right? And uh, well. If I take, well, I, I have to admit here, I'm showing these, uh, these curves, which were, uh, which were smoothened by, well, the logarithmic fit. But if I show these data along with the experimental data, unlike these horizontal lines I showed before, uh, if I just plug in these into the Gassman equation and calculate the overall modulus of the solid, material filled filled with these argon uh these are what what i'm these these green curves are what what i'm going to get depending on which value of ks i'm taking so the slope is clearly the same as experimental data there is yes there is some arbitrariness with regard to the properties of the solid but that's not something i can control so it's so, a good agreement with experimental data, uh, but let's let's discuss some physics. Let's see what's um, what is the phenomenon which we're seeing. So I'm showing these curves again. Are uh, clearly the modulus is monotonically growing with the relative pressure. If I plot them in log scale, they start looking like straight lines, all right? And that's actually uh, something which uh, which can be easily explained, right? So when fluid uh, is absorbed in a tiny pore, right? The, the pressure inside the pore is defined as, um, well, is governed by the solid fluid interactions and by the capillary pressure, the, well, what is called Laplace pressure, right? So the, the pressure in the pore deviates from the pressure outside. And this is the same pressure, which is, uh, which is the driving force for the absorption induced deformation. So um, this part depends on solid liquid interaction. And this part is simply the logarithm uh, P over P naught, right? On the other hand, if I look uh, at how the modulus of a solid or of a fluid or anything uh, of a material depends on pressure. If we're at low pressure, it's of course constant, right? This is what I call K of zero, at zero pressure. Uh, however, when a material, be it solid or fluid, is exposed to very high pressure, comparable to the modulus itself, then you can introduce a linear correction for uh, for the pressure. Well, you can introduce quadratic term and so on, but uh, for sure you can correct it with this linear term. And this this is what is called uh, as tate mernigan equation or Mernigan equation or birch mernigan uh, in different its variations comes from this old paper by, by Mernigan. And so the modulus is linear with the pressure in the pore. The pressure in the pore is logarithmic with the vapor pressure. Therefore, well, this is what we, we got. We, we got this linear dependence of the modulus on the, on the log uh, P of, uh, over P naught. So the, the most interesting thing though, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump for the previous slide for a second, is when these term vanishes, right? When the P equals to P zero, when the, we're at, saturation pressure, the, the, here the moduli of the fluid 
will be still different. They will still deviate from the bulk. They will deviate because of this extra pressure term. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to look at these values as a function of the pore size. And I am showing here only curves for three pore sizes. Later, we did calculations for more pore sizes in the range from uh, two, well, almost two nanometers, two, uh, two 25 nanometers, uh, all the way up to, I think, nine nanometers. So the scale here, I want to emphasize this is, uh, it says pore size, but it's actually one over pore size. So it's the reciprocal pore size, right? Uh, here it's the, the zero corresponds to bulk, 10 nanometers corresponds, well, it's here and two nanometers is here. So, and there, there was a lot of, um, were a lot of some GCMC runs when we got these nice uh, moduli for the fluid uh, in the pores of different sizes. And the dash dotted line here shows the bulk value. And the bulk value doesn't matter whether it's a bulk uh, experimental or bulk modeling, they match nicely. So we see that the further, well, the smaller the pore is, the further we deviate from the bulk value for the modulus. And uh, this deviation actually is described by, by simple linear dependence. So uh, that actually, again, makes a lot of sense because uh, the pressure in the fluid when the pore is completely filled uh, is related to these solid liquid interactions which scales like one over the pore size. And then again, if we have the tate mernigan equation in mind, we have the linear dependence of the modulus on pressure. Well, if this goes as one over the pore size, then the modulus will be linear with one over the pore size. And this is exactly what we observed in the simulations. And actually that also gives, um, uh, gives a, an idea of uh, relation between the pore size and the modulus. So how how can we we can say that each pore size corresponds to its uh, well a certain value of the modulus, and maybe use it for uh, determination of the pore size if we can readily measure the modulus of the fluid in it. Well, uh, molecular simulations are great. The only problem there quite long to run. And actually I'm very happy to present it in these audience specifically, because at some point we decided, how about we look at the equation of state? Because, well, we want to save in our computations, right? Maybe we can come up with an equation of state, which, is, which describes thermodynamics of confined fluids and could be applicable to the phenomena which we observed. And we, we chose this equation of state from uh, Travelloni and co-authors. Um, some of these co-authors are obviously here. And uh, we chose this equation of state, which is that uh, uh, I think it's one of the simplest form they come up with because in later papers, they developed it further, but uh, this is Van der Waals equation of state with these correction term relate to the confinement, but it's it's physics based. It's based on a simple model for the fluid, simple model for the solid. However, it almost quantitatively describes many of the phenomena you can observe, yet the form of it, the analytical form of it is still quite simple. So what we did, well, this is the, these are the approximations they use. The, they use square well for the fluid fluid interaction. They use square well potential for solid fluid interactions. They use cylindrical pore geometry. I didn't show any uh, data for our uh, simulation of cylindrical pore. Qualitatively, they're similar to what we saw for the spherical pores. And the good thing from that, we can get an analytic expression for the modulus. Can just take these derivative and take it by hand and and get get an expression. Yes, it's a it's a little bit. Uh, long, but uh, well, better than numerics. Um, 
And this is what we tried and we decided, okay, how about we compare it to what we got with our simulations? I want to emphasize the simula simulations were done for a conventional model argon in silica pores. So it was all Leonard Jones interactions, not square well. So please don't, don't expect to see a perfect match. Uh, however, this is, uh, this is what we got. So um, we, chose, we chose parameters for these uh, epsilon P and delta P, the main two parameters in the equation by Travelloni and uh, co-authors. Uh, we chose them so that they, uh, the adsorption isotherms calculated based on this equation, the, the Kepler condensation points more or less match the phase transition we see on our simulated isotherms. And we did simulations for two temperatures. Uh, actually the data while at low temperature uh, in cylindrical pores, we have these almost solidification of argon there. It, it becomes very ordered. Uh, so the data becomes very noisy. So we, we run the simulations at higher temperature as well. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, we, we relied on these data primarily. Um, so the isotherms, well, obviously they don't match quantitatively, but they, they more or less, you know, they match qualitatively, right? And based on these isotherms, uh, we calculated the moduli using our analytical formula based on the equation of state. Um, so these curves, well, the, the markers show the simulation results uh, and the lines here show the results from the equation of state. Yes, of course, they, are, they don't match. They don't match uh, quantitatively, except for maybe the, the curve at two nanometers. Uh, but then qualitatively, we can, see, we can see this trend clearly with the larger, um, the poor, first of all, the logarithmic trend for the um, dependence on the pressure, and then the trend with the dependence on the pore size. So the, uh, the smaller is the pore size, the higher would be this modulus. And we show also the data for 87.3 Kelvin, where actually the simulations didn't do a good job because as I mentioned in cylindrical pores, we get these ordering of um, Leonard Jones argon and the data became very scattered and noisy, uh, but the equation of state data, well, looks nice and smooth. So um, overall, I can come to the conclusions. First of all, ultrasound propagation in fluid saturated nanoporous media uh, shows deviation of the fluid elastic modulus from its value for a bulk fluid. Elastic modulus of the fluid depends um, as a linear function on a logarithm of the relative pressure. While uh, elastic modulus of argon in silica pore calculated based on molecular simulation agrees well with the experimental observations and Moreover, the molecular simulation predict a linear dependence of elastic modulus on the reciprocal pore size, uh, one over D, which, by the way, has not been observed in the experiment because they all used the same type of samples. Uh, modified van der Waals equation of state for confined fluids provides an analytic expression for the modulus, which qualitatively agrees with the predictions by molecular simulation. And the next step uh, is, well, we want to get more ultrasonic absorption experimental data to verify some of the findings we observed in our simulations. And with that, I'm showing the last slide where I first want to thank you. Second, I want to uh, mention that while well, it's been published in the series of work of my group, and uh, a lot of these results were summarized in a review paper written by uh, Chris Dobrzhansky, Boris Gurevich, and myself, which came, uh, in, came out in uh, applied physics reviews last year. And 
with regard to the experimental part, uh, we're currently looking for a postdoc for a PhD student uh, to work on these ultrasound absorption experiments. So if you're interested or if you know somebody who is interested, please uh, email me and uh, we will talk. Thank you very much for the attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Gore, for your presentation. We are now open for questions. So if anyone would like to ask one, please enable your microphone or write it down in the chat so we can read it. Our YouTube viewers can also ask questions, of course. So who would like to be the first one? Can I? Please go ahead, Professor. Hi, Gore. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, like, uh, I have a, a doubt. Uh, it's not exactly a question. Uh, maybe uh, I want to, to understand better. Uh, can you put your slide 12? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, you, you have shown uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think it's this one. Yeah, it's this one. Uh, <clears throat> you have a kind of hysteresis and uh, you have two modulus uh, when you go, uh, when you absorb and when you dissolve uh, the materials. Uh, uh, it means that you have uh, two pore sizes, is it? Or is, 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 this hysteresis come from, um, is because you have two pore size or is only a module from the fluid inside. So the fluid is uh, condensate or not. It's, it's a, I, I, I have a doubt about this. Um, Fred, may I, uh, may I clarify which, which hysteresis are you talking about? Not, not the absorption hysteresis or th this one? Yeah. That's yeah. A, but that's, that's related to the, um, to the hysteresis on the isotherm. And I actually, I think it's better to, because the data on argon is qualitatively very similar to the data on hexane, I think it's better visible on the hexane data uh, because uh -huh. here you can see adsorption isotherm, right? You have these capillary yeah. condensation points somewhere here, right? And then this is where these modulus changes, right? And same with the capillary evaporation, which is, well, that's a typical adsorption desorption hysteresis in the pore of uh, several nanometers wide, right? And then you have the same for the, um, for the modulus. Here, maybe the points don't match exactly, but I think the reason for that is because they actually did the measurements separately. They did the adsorption measurement separately from the modulus measurement. Hypothetically, if you measure them uh, at the same time, uh, you would have these hysteresis matching exactly these hysteresis here. So it would be the same pressure values. So there is not, it's not related to the, the change in the structure of the solid phase. No, I don't think so. I okay. don't think so. So it's directly related to absorption itself. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So I was, I was confused about that because you start to talk about uh, the structure, changing the structure, and also changing the fluid uh, structure. And also kind of like, mm -hmm. otherwise make, uh, maybe confused. Uh, another point is uh, you, you have shown a nice uh, picture that uh, a linear behavior between the modules and, and with their elongations. Uh, uh, is it true for more complex system, uh, I mean, in, in several of these uh, uh, elasticity, you may have a uh, different length scale for elasticity. And, 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 and uh, so if, if, it, if you have more than one uh, 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 length scale for elasticity, do you have this relation, linear relation? Um, I don't I, know if I, I was clear. 
my I, yes, I wanted to clarify what do you mean by different lens scales for the elasticity. Like, so like, that's like a, you you have a micro pore and a, a, a large pore, and the, and they may have different uh, uh, elongation structure or characteristics. Or so uh, in this case, I don't know if you if this match. So I have to I have to admit this is this is a this is a great question because uh, here in this sample in in Viker right it's mostly mesoporous so we don't need to worry that much about microporosity if you think of a sample which has certain uh, significant microporosity which can actually be filled at earlier at lower pressures and can affect uh, both the deformation of the of the solid and then can affect also the elastic properties of the solid because the pores will be filled and the uh, elastic properties would be different. It could be a much more complicated behavior. And I don't think that uh, I remember talking uh, I remember working on that and talking, we had a lot of discussions with Alex Neymar about it earlier uh, when we worked together. And um, this problem of how different, uh, different pore sizes contribute to the resulting deformation, I think it's still to some extent an open question. There is no better model than just, you know, sort of a completely homogeneous model. But I think th these effects can be observed. Um, this is why I said the number one goal for me in this project is not more molecular simulation, but more experimental data, because we want to explore samples which would be different, different in terms of a pore size, different in terms of a pore structure, uh, maybe these uh, bimodal distribution and so on. So to, to learn more, to learn more from the experiments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I can ask a, a question. Of course, um, go ahead. So, so very nice work, uh, Gennady, really interesting. Um, I was wondering in your slide 21, where you show that variation with pore size. So it's quite linear up to, or down to around about two nanometers, right? So do you expect this to stay the same as you go to smaller pores or, or you know, when, when, the, when the, the, the potential field of the two walls starts to overlap, this might break down, perhaps in the same way as the Kelvin equation breaks down when you, when you, when you have condensation? Do you, what, what do you think? It's, it's an excellent question, Miguel. Thank you. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm not expecting these to, to continue to be linear. Furthermore, we have data which shows that it's, doesn't continue like that for what we call micropores. And there is yet another, you know, this is actually yet another contribution to this distinction between mesopores and micropores. So the trend is different, uh, but, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we will, we will show these data very soon. Uh, so it's, uh, it's one of my, one of my students is working on that and uh, hopefully Hopefully, we'll be able to to publish and present it soon. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask a question? I have some curiosity about the measurement of PVT data mm, for fruit. Yeah, is um, Papa. Mm -hmm. Can I ask something? Please go ahead, Professor. Yeah, uh, when you are measuring, you uh, uh, know that the pressure inside the pore is different to the uh, uh, bulk fluid pressure. Mm -hmm. And how the experimental scheme can take it account, this phenomenon? Uh, you mean that how we can take into account in experiment, how can we take into account the difference between pressure in the pore and uh, the vapor pressure? Yes, yeah, in the bulk I, fluid pressure. I think, yeah, it's a, thank you. It's a great question. I think um, 
you cannot measure it directly, obviously, right? You cannot stick a manometer in your in your pore. However, because it's well, right now it's pretty much accepted that uh, as a result of these pressure, you get adsorption induced deformation. As a result of the pressure in the pores, your sample elongate. From this elongation, you can calculate your pressure. You can at least estimate it. Of course, there, there are a lot of mechanics questions in line with what Fred asked about uh, if the system is very complicated. Uh, however, you can you can get at least an estimate for these uh, for these pressure from the deformation measurements. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think Hugen Lange has posted a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it or, or should I read it? All right. I'll read it then. Uh, thanks for your talk, Professor War. For non-polar porous materials, will there be the effect of capillary condensation or does it only occur in silica with noble gases? Okay, so uh, will the capillary, or does it only occur in silica with noble gases? So for, first of all, if this is, the, the capillary condensation is, uh, I think, I think nothing will, you know, it, it's, it, it is really is a, res, a result of the solid fluid interactions. And this is, uh, doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's uh, polar molecules with, uh, with non-polar uh, or, you know, be it argon and carbon, be it water in Silica, as long as you have certain interactions, uh, yes, you would have you would have the effect of capillary condensation. So it's it the the degree of capillary condensation to what extent you would have the change of your condensation pressure. Well, it depends on the surface properties. Yes, uh, but with regard to the effects uh, we see here, they also will take place irrespective of whether we have silica or whether we have carbon. In fact, I'm showing the results for silica. We did simulations for, for carbon. We did, um, we did simulations for methane absorption in carbon pores because that's of practical importance. And actually uh, many of the effects were qualitatively the same as here. They're actually, uh, when you look at methane, which is super critical, of course you have much stronger effects. The, uh, supercritical fluid is more compressible. So, and the compressibility appears to be more sensitive to the confinement as well. And this is actually, this is a published uh, published data, which I, um, yeah, just didn't, didn't have a chance to include here. Um, yeah, I hope I answered the, the question. All right, I think someone wants to ask a question. I don't know who iPhone is. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, hi there. All right. Dev me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, nice say, cycle, say, Professor. Say your name, please. Yeah, uh, this is Hassan from awesome. the USP. Okay, okay, I know you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome. <Nice. laughs> Thank you. Uh, nice talk, Professor. I have a list of questions here. Uh, you know, uh, just let me uh, talk about three main, uh, my main three concerns. First, uh, you know, the, the, the temperature that you used here are uh, very low. In fact, when you, uh, we want to transform this kind of a model and application to reservoir temperatures, uh, we should go beyond to uh, higher temperatures. So I just uh, see that in the lecture that the temperatures are really low and how we can transfer these models to higher temperatures and consider the effect of the temperatures on the measurement and the modeling. That was my uh, first one. And about the second one or third one, should I uh, ask the uh, no, or should wait for I, your I answer. can give a short answer to I can give a short answer to this. Think in terms of the reduced uh, reduced temperature. 
and everything's uh-huh. going to be fine. We're dealing with liquid argon here. So think, think of something, think of something else and take the same reduced temperature. You would get the more or less the same, uh, the same effect. Uh, and, um, we did simulations for, uh, methane, uh, you know, at actually at quite high temperatures. Well, it's uh, both subcritical and supercritical, uh, and uh, it's 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 not. There are there are other things, but but the main effect which I'm showing here, it does not it does not change much as long as the uh, the fluid stays liquid like or even supercritical fluid. It's it's fine as long as it's not uh-huh. vapor. You you can see it. Uh huh. And uh, my my second question is that you know you use the Van der Waal equation of state, and my, my main concern here is that Van der Waal can uh, represent which kind of fluid in the nature of a bulk fluid, so we can consider the effect then consider the effect of a pour on it for and said okay, Van der Waal represent a fluid. Uh, X in an, a bulk nature, and how we can trust on uh, the result for a pool, um, specifically the nano pool here. So uh, it's actually well, I probably should uh, should let Fred a- answer these question because I'm using the equation developed by uh, well, he he's one of the uh, authors on this paper and. Uh, on the following paper. So they actually proposed a nice equation of state, which is, yes, it's based on Van der Waals, but in addition to these first two terms, you have this, well, quite significant third term, which comes from assuming uh, confinement of a fluid in a cylindrical pore with the square well potential of interaction of the of the molecules to to the walls. So the physics, the, this confinement physics, it's already there in this equation. I'm I'm just I'm just using it. And the reason I'm using Van der Waals and not something else is because oh, it's it's the simplest. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Elvis said his microphone is not working, so I'll read his question. He asks if you can you verify the modulus logarithm dependence in the Trevelyan ULS. Uh, yep, I think I I went through it too quickly, but basically you can you can look at these lines here, and this this dependence is there. This this so the solid lines is the Trevelyan equation of state predictions, and uh, and the the points are the simulations. Uh, and yes, they both gave this logarithmic dependence. Yeah, quantitatively they don't match, but I didn't expect them to match for you know comparing apples to oranges, right? Uh, but qualitatively, the effect is there, and the pore size effect is there as well, which is even even more pleasant because the pore size is something which we did not, uh, people did not show experimentally. They, they all took Viker glass and they do experiments on Viker glass where the pore sizes are all roughly the same. All right, I think that answers it. Would you like to ask any more questions, Elvis? Okay, thank you. So, do we have any more questions? Just a comment. Uh, w- w- uh, indeed, we extend this e- simple equation to uh, Peng Robson and other kind of uh, equation of states to improve these, uh, what, uh, uh, well, the behavior, the better behavior in- inside the pore and outside the pore. But I didn't want to, to, <laughs> to talk only and uh, not to overlap what we uh, uh, God were saying. Okay. All right. So I think it's time to wrap it up then. Once again, thank you so much, Professor Gore, for your presentation. Thank you. It was uh, truly a pleasure. I enjoyed all the questions. Mm-hmm.